introduction remarks. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, this, uh, this symposium will be recorded. Uh, we have a document for notes. Um, please fill in your name uh, under the participants in, in the notes. You can also um, use the document for asking questions. Um, although we would prefer if you were asked your questions directly in the chat. Um, in the discussion session, um, please raise your hands if you uh, would like to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to talk. Um, the purpose of this uh, symposium is to report on the developments uh, of new standards in support of the digital specimen concept. And the purpose of this symposium is also to encourage wider participation. Uh, so we hope that we can get uh, all of you enthusiastic to uh, start collaborating in this uh, endeavor. Um, we plan to have uh, four talks. Um, however, um, uh, one talk uh, was canceled last minute. Um, that's the, uh, the talk from uh, Jim Beach. Um, so we will have only three um, uh, talks uh, today. Um, the first uh, talk is, uh, is about uh, OpenDS, uh, given by Alex Hardesty, and then we have an introduction to, uh, to MITS, uh, LSPET, and then we will have a talk about periodistal objects uh, by Sharif Islam. And the pro procedure for this meeting, uh, please treat the session as an equal opportunity for all, uh, be polite, kind and inclusive. And uh, please remember the code of conduct. Uh, here's the link to it if you have not yet seen it. Um, as I said, the, the chat function is available for asking questions. Um, please use it carefully and appropriately. Um, if you use it improperly, you may uh, be removed from the session. Um, please also keep your microphones muted. They should be muted by default when not speaking. And, and use, as I said, the raise hand feature. Um, please also bear in mind, bear, bear with us with any technical difficulties we may have, and we hope that you enjoy the event. Thank you. Um, Alex, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see the, the presentation slides. Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about um, OpenDS, the proposed new standard for uh, open digital specimens. And particularly, I'm going to talk about um, recent progress that we've made. And there's an accompanying abstract that you can find in the BIS journal um, to back up this presentation. Okay, so um, a year ago at the Biodiversity Next uh, event in, in Leiden in the Netherlands, uh, we, um, by, by we I mean DISCO, introduced the, the idea of, of digital specim specimens to, to the community. Um, we describe digital specimens as, as providing an anchoring function uh, for all kinds of data from, from physical specimens, um, not only the data which can be directly um, obtained from the physical object itself, but uh, data that can be derived for, by other kinds of analysis and computational methods, like genomic data and uh, species interaction data and ecological data and biochemical data and so on and, and so forth. Um, and, and, but these digital specimens on the internet are more than just digital representations. They act as processable twins for the, the physical specimens in collections, because of course a computer can't process a physical specimen, but it can process the data about that specimen. And these, these digital specimens can be manipulated remotely across a network by, by machines and, and by humans as an actionable knowledge unit. And, and this aspect of manipulation by, by machines is often understated or even forgotten because you know, historically and traditionally it's, it's humans that have worked with, with physical specimen objects and you know, some of the digital data that's derived from them. 
-hmm. Here's a simple example of a, of, a of a digital specimen. At the center in the top, you can see a physical specimen which has the identifier BMNH 2006 12 6 40 41. And you can see on the right uh, another physical specimen with the, the identifier MNH, MNHN JNC 1848D1, uh, which sits in the Paris Museum. First one is in the London Museum. One is a holotype of the other, and the, the, uh, and, and the other is the paratype. Uh, you can see that it's a specimen of Holorchis castex, and there is an entry in the catalogue of life for it. It has a CTAF stable identifier, which allows you to find it in the Natural History Museum's data portal. It has an identifier to, to the taxonomic treatment information in, in Plaus's treatment bank. It has identifiers to, to sequences in, in GenBank, and it has identifiers and links to literature which describe this specimen. One of the interesting things about the link to the genetic sequence, if you look carefully, is that the um, the identifier of the specimen in GenBank is missing the hyphen between the 40 and the 41. And this is, this is typical of some of the difficulties that we have in making links between different information in different places. And all of the data in these relationships, the, the links to this data and the relationships are wrapped up in this digital specimen and it gets its own identifier. As an example, there, shown as the NSID 25,125 and so on and so forth. And this can all be all be serialized and packaged as a JSON fragment, for example, which allows it to be moved around or processed. As twins of physical specimens, digital specimens can enable transformations of working practices. They can allow wider access for research and learning through packaging of images and links to third party data and working with data where access to the physical specimen itself is not needed. They allow the attaching of annotations and interpretations, the arrangement of loans and visits, the attribution of work done, which specimens were used and which persons were credited. They support curation by the community of experts and provenance can be traced. By inserting relations between multiple specimens and between specimens and other data, we can grow a a pit graph that organically uh, increases in size that can be used for an analysis and inference of the relationships between specimens and data derived from and about those specimens. And we can organize digital specimens in virtual groupings of related specimens by, by their gathering event, by their exocati, by thematic criteria of your choice, etc. And unlike physical specimens, digital specimens can belong to many different collections simultaneously, if that's appropriate. And these specimens allow machine processing, learning and analysis, data mining on a very large scale for all kinds of interdisciplinary work that can be based upon collections. Making this vision of, of digital specimens a, real, a reality requires a specification for open digital specimens, which we call OpenDS. Digital specimens and the way that they, that they represented are standardized for exchange and transfer between computer systems and interoperability between so different software programs. And importantly, to our, allow operations to act remotely over the internet on digital specimens in other systems. And this allows both machines as well as humans to process digital specimens. And OpenDS will specify what a digital specimen is in, ter in terms of information uh, content so that it has meaning and context. It specifies how to include the specimen data itself as well as all data derived from a specimen, i.e. the scientific content and its structure. It specifies how machines and humans can act on a digital specimen and gain attribution for their work and how the data can be serialized and packaged for transfer across the network. OpenDS is an enriched, in, an enriched specimen information model that links derived or related data back to the physical specimens. And we've recently published some answers to some frequently asked specific questions about digital specimens and OpenDS, which you can find at that short link that's shown on the bottom of your screen, bit.ly slash OpenDS FAQ. 
In the 12 months since Biodiversity Next, a lot of things have happened. The ISTIC project, integration, oh, innovation and consolidation of, of digitization for heritage, a European funded project, completed its work on digital specimen architecture design and on the recommendations for the future design of the dist distributed system of scientific collections in Europe, supported by the DISCO data management plan. The Cost Mobilize Action ran an open DS work workshop in Warsaw in February, just before most of the world was uh, uh, struck by the, the, the current COVID uh, pandemic, where a wide measure of interest and acceptance of the idea of open DS and, and digital specimens was expressed even if not all of the details are yet fully understood and agreed. And in the recently commenced DISCO Prepare project, we've begun the technical work in detail on OpenDS, and we've established dialogues with various initiatives, including iDigBio, GBIF, Specify Collections Consortium, and the Biodiversity Collections Network. And these are growing and an, an, an intensive discussion uh, uh, channels that we will be developing further over the coming months. At the same time as this, in the USA, the extended specimen network or extended specimen concept and extended specimen network concept have emerged. And specifically, there has been a, a publication in Biosciences in January of this year on a strategy to enhance US biodiversity collections and promote research and education through the extended specimen initiative. And when we look at the similarities between open digital specimens and extended specimens, we find there's a lot of common ground. Three weeks ago, at the first Tadwig 2020 uh, working sessions, we hold a, held a bird of a feather session on the 22nd of September, and I'll mention that more in the next slide. And coming up in a few weeks time at the next Research Data Alliance plenary meeting, uh, number 16, There'll be a specific meeting of the Biodiversity Data Integration Interest Group on, on Thursday, the 12th of November, where this topic will again be on the agenda. Of course, a standard for open digital specimens needs to be realised on a global level. It helps us all if we avoid fragmentation and, and duplication of work. And so we propose that OpenDS should become a new TADVIC standard and that visions for digital specimens and extended specimens must align. This was the main outcome of the birds of the feather session that I referred to a moment ago. Another out outcome was that those present agreed on the need to have a global collaborative process towards this standard on the converged concept that's open to all with an interest in specimens and samples. And a letter of intent has been established. Again, there's a short link there, and we invite you to sign it if you've not already signed it, either in your capacity as an individual or if you're able to sign it on behalf of your organization to, to do so. The last time I looked a few days ago, 16 organizations and 17 individuals had given their support so far. Coming to the end now, I just want to talk for a few minutes about the technical foundations of OpenDS. It's going, to, it's going to start from where ABCD3, uh, its extension for geosciences and Darwin Core leave off, especially from their aligned version, which is coming. It will extend from obo foundry uh, ontologies, such as the biological collection ontology and the ontology for biomedical investigations and the information content entity, uh, sorry, the information artifact ontology. The diagram on the right there shows how, how these three ontologies, how, how two of these three ontologies, the OBI and the BCO, currently handle specimens. Um, in the OBI, we have uh, uh, the notion of a planned process and, and a gathering or specimen collection is a planned process which, which can generate processed material. One kind of processed material is a material entity of an organism uh, which is an input to that specimen collection process and an output is a preserved specimen. Of course, we need a new kind of process which isn't represented in these ontologies, a digitization process that produces a digital specimen. And so we propose uh, a, a, an open digital specimen ontology which takes a BCO specimen as its input as a new class uh, and, and produce it, sorry, it takes BCO specimen as its input and produces a new class of ODS digital specimen as it's an output. 
And at the highest level, we tie this in with the Research Data Alliance Tadwig Attribution Metadata Recommendation, where digital specimens are instances of entities in, in the PROF model, for, for those of you that are familiar with the PROF model. And the digitization process is an instance of an activity that can be performed by some agent to produce that entity. Hence, digitization and subsequent work on that digital specimen can be attributed to someone. I'll leave it there and say, if you want to follow the work, you can find a repository on GitHub, uh, disco slash OpenDS. And if you want to become involved in this work, which we would very much appreciate, then please my email me at my email address that's shown on the screen. And I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. This is a lot of information to digest, I think, for many of us. Um, if there's anybody who has a question uh, already, please raise your hand. I didn't see any questions in the chat yet. And there's a question coming in from David Shorthouse. He's asking, is there an outer shell to a digital specimen or a depth to the links that circumscribe uh, a digital specimen? Um. Okay, so I'm not sure what David means by an, an outer shell. Uh, I can interpret that in, 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 in two ways. One is uh, to interpret it in the context of the, the object model that I just described and to say that a, an outer shell of the object or the abstract uh, class from which a digital specimen is derived would be the entity class. Um, but I suspect this is something to do more with the scope of uh, the content of a digital specimen, and 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 I would say that there is uh, there is no length, no there is no limit to the the, the links that can be um, associated with the specimen, and uh, we have a generic extension mechanism uh, that, that avoids the need to define specific types of link over the long term. Okay. I see, Matt, uh, you had about the same remark. Is it clear enough like this? Okay. See another question from David. Are the metadata on the edges of the graph? like directionality, confidence, temporary validity, uh, attribution for creator or link timestamps? Uh, I don't think we've specifically considered that yet, but uh, it, there certainly could be. I think you may, may, uh, missed a question from Steve Raskalf as well. Um, about him. Yes. So what's this? Question from Steve. I'm concerned about generating a model specifically related to specimens without coordinating with models that would also accommodate images, like remote sensing and DNA samples where no specimens are collected. How are you coordinating your work with these other communities? The answer to that is that you know we we are slowly establishing dialogues. Uh, we have a dialogue uh, between Disco and Elixir, for example, which is looking more closely at the relationship between DNA samples and, and, and specimens. Um, we haven't yet uh, established dialogues with remote sensing uh, uh, groups as yet. Um, Okay, I think we, uh, it's time to, dis, uh, to continue with the next uh, presentation. We have more time for discussions uh, after the presentations. Um, Elsbeth, can I give the floor to you? Can you stop sharing your screen, Alex? Sorry, yes. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen and you can hear me as well. So um, it's I think follows on very nicely from from Alex's talk because this is to some extent taking a step further down into 
uh, the, uh, the digital specimen. And first off, I want to kind of talk in more in general about digitization. And if we see as digitization as being the process of um, converting analog data about physical specimens to digital representation. So that's going to include the electronic text, the images and, and other forms. Um, the minimal information about a digital specimen or MIDS is essentially a specification defining the information elements that are expected to be present when you're publishing digitized information about specimens um, at various levels of digitization. And this is um, with the understanding that digital specimens are online digital representations of their physical counterparts um, in natural science collections. So this talk really is aiming to introduce the proposed mid structure and to present the current state of play with the specification. So most natural science collections are putting massive efforts into digitizing the collections to open them up to, to scientists and, and actually increasingly to a much wider audience. <clears throat> and it's becoming more important in terms of prioritization, communication and alignment of, the, of the, this huge amount of work that we can define what we mean by the use of the term digitization. So the MIDS standard um, aims to give our community a framework to define and clarify what is meant by the digital, so the different levels of digitization, um, as well as the minimum effort information, sorry, to be captured at each level. So this framework will make it easier to consistently measure the extent of digitization achieved over time and to set priorities for the remaining work. So it also uh, aims to ensure that enough data are captured curated and published so that they can be useful for the widest possible um, range of future research, whether it's teaching and learning purposes as well. So MIDS, as I've mentioned briefly, is, is, a, is a minimum specification. So that means that the information that's specified as necessary at each MIDS level is the minimum expected. Um, and it's um, essentially more is, is certainly not restricted. So from September 2020, the mid specification work is now the work topic of an approved Tadwig task group, the MIDS task group. So um, what I do want to convey is, is kind of the, the, the bigger picture of the mid structure. Um, rather than the detail. I'll, I've got some slides on the detail coming up, but um, this is one of the key slides that I want to, to cover, um, describing the different MIDS levels and the structure that we're, we're proposing. So MIDS 1 um, is essentially the level that many of the mass digitization programs are working to. And there's a reason that these digitization programs are working to this level. Um, and it's, it's fundamentally about basic management, curation, and findability of individual specimens. Um, and it also allows a huge amount of communication and information um, work um, to be carried out, which refers to the specimens. Um, but it's it's very cost efficient method of digitization. So it's kind of going for uh, a level that achieves a certain um, ability for collections to work with their specimens and for people to find the specimens. MIDS 2 um, is the level that most of the biodiversity, including taxonomic research, is essentially working to. So it in includes um, some of the key data that uh, this kind of research critically needs. Um, and it also includes information that have been historically used for citation for referring to the to the specimen. MIDS 3 is essentially a kind of gold standard and it's aiming to bring together all the information relating to the specimen um, as an end point. Um, what I've mentioned here is a, a kind of mid zero, a pre-level uh, mid zero, which um, is referred to as the cat catalog 
level. And the reason we brought this in is um, this is being used in some institutes as a kind of precursor to digitization. And more importantly, it, it, it does uh, enable communication and it also provides uh, a point to which additional information can be attached to, to, this, to the specimen record. So um, finally, it became clear um, early in these discussions that the image and other media could not really form an integral part of the internal structure of the MIDS levels. Um, and that the best way to include them was really as an additional element to be attached to a MIDS level. So given um, that there are so many levels of images and other media involved, so this includes uh, whole drawer images, uh, images of complete specimens, images from the specimen label, um, microscopy images, 3D images, videos, audio files, etc. So it was really um, clear that this element is really going to need additional specification development. Um, but we didn't want this to stop us from finalizing the MIDS levels in the meantime. So we've um, included just the, the I or the M to indicate that there is an image or other media attached to the digital specimen. So essentially in this um, kind of harmonizing framework, we've included making the data publicly available um, because that's so often treated as a slightly separate, slightly separate from the um, digitization. And publicly available means not only to humans, but also for machines and to find and access um, the specimens as well. And this is really following the FAIR principles which we're, we're striving towards. So um, as I've mentioned, the, the, the catalogue, the pre-level um, is this kind of um, skeletal record making the association between the identifier of a physical specimen and its digital representation. The basic level, which I'm going to spend a little bit more time looking at, um, is essentially capturing that, that essential uh, what it is and where it can be found information. And so um, as we review the, the minimal information elements within each of these levels, I do want to stress that the elements are still under discussion and the work within the task group is looking at tightening up each of the elements and deciding on whether it should or can be included in the standard, which will um, um, be coming in the, in the following year. Um, the, the items in here, which are asterisked, are the elements that are included in the catalog mids level zero. And the, the four uh, most important elements of the mids one are, are highlighted in bold. Um, and they're the ones that we're concentrating more of our attention on to start with. Um, and we'll give, I'll give you some more information about um, some of the work we've been doing um, on the data for these um, in later slides. So I'm going to come to the regular MIDS level two next. And this essentially includes all the elements we've seen in MIDS level one, plus these additional elements. Um, again, as with MIDS level one, um, these are under discussion and there are also some elements in here which can be considered to be more important than the others. Um, there are also some that are um, potentially um, easier to calculate as well. In MIDS level three, um, this is extent the extended uh, MIDS level. Um, and this is where we're looking at um, providing um, additional data, including links to third party sources. So examples of that might be, for example, uh, uh, GBIF DNA sequences, literature sources. We could also potentially add quality assertions here. Um, it, I think it's very important to realize that um, the MIDS level is not about quality. 
It's about whether the data are present or not, rather than the quality of the data present. And as you can see, the, the examples that we have here of the, of the mid level three, the extended level. So when we're looking at actually calculating mids, um, it can be mids can be calculated at various different levels. You can have a, a mids level for an individual specimen. You can also have mids levels um, for, for collections by um, seeing the, the, the pulling the, the specimens together as a whole. So you can have a percentage of a collection at various mids levels. And this is where it becomes uh, most useful, I think, for for helping to prioritize and to um, progress digitization programs. So what we've been looking at is, is the um, feasibility of calculating mids levels from the data. Um, and one um, large analysis that we've been looking at is with the uh, GBIF data set, uh, which we downloaded, um, of which um, GBIF kindly provided for us. In, in June. Um, and in this data set, um, it's a data set, I have to say, of um, preserved specimens, fossils, and living collections only. And in this data set, we've got um, about 105 million specimens at MIDS level one. Um, this is essentially 63% of the specimens in that data set. And if we consider the, the total um, number of specimens held in natural history collections as being 3 billion, um, then this would be th essentially 3.5% of the total. Um, if we're then looking at uh, MIDS level 1i, and that's one uh, specimens with an image, and these are um, with media in GBIF, then we've got about 5,500. I think. What this really shows as well is um, it shows that calculating MIDs from uh, GBIF data is, is possible, it's feasible. Um, but what I wanted to show you as well, just to give you a feel of how, how that was done, um, because this is going to be part of the, the work of the task group, um, and to see where the the current collections kind of fall down slightly um, in terms of, of digitization and the data captured. Um, what we can see is, um, the, for example, the record creator um, is currently not, um, not really there in, in GBIF, whereas something like the, the name, a scientific name, um, those are applied in GBIF. And so 100% of the, the specimens had that a name at some taxonomic level. Um, so it's really the, the, the specimen metadata, the creation date um, and the modified date that are, are the slightly problematic um, within, within the GBIF data. Um, for mids level two, um, the picture is quite interesting. Some of the elements are obviously seen as um, highly important and uh, regularly captured and submitted to GBIF, um, some less so. And I think this is where we're really seeing um, a key issue, and this is going to be missing data and not allocating a value if the data are not present on the label. This is where this starts becoming an issue. And this is um, something that is going to need to be tackled by the, by the, the, ta uh, the Tadwick task group and wider community with, I think, some difficult decisions to be made about missing data and recording missing data. So um, I want to summarize now. Um, and really, that the, the, as we said, the aim of, of MIDS, um, it's, not just a, it's not just a paper sort of exercise. It's really to enable more strategic digitization of collections where um, each piece of data is fitting into an underlying purpose and use. And the digitization effort 
really should be going into the elements of the data that are of most use to the end users. Um, so this is seen as a framework for um, prioritizing the digitization process. Um, but also part of the picture is about specimen digitization pipelines and ensuring that each specimen is sent along the relevant pipeline um, using human and automated processes for both the pipe, uh, pipeline selection and the resulting data capture or analysis. And I think what's becoming very clear is, as I've mentioned, is the importance of how we record missing data. So there's a lot of work to do, and we're um, emphasizing the invitation to um, for the community to join in the work. Um, we have the, as I've mentioned, the task group for the MIDS. And I've got the link there. We'll make sure the link's in the chat as well. Um, obviously, it's when the, within the context that um, nothing is stands alone. This is very, very definitely within the context of the collection descriptions interest group and the work being done there. And also, as we've said, the, the open DS, the digital specimen work. And then finally, I would just like to um, you know, thank the members of the CTAF Digitization Working Group who've been helping with this um, and the ISTC. Um, Obviously, the herb uh, herbarium team at uh, the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, but also digitization teams around the world who are really working to make these specimens accessible um, to all, and the team at uh, GBIF um, for help with the with providing the GBIF data. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Elspeth. Um, I see a question in the chat from uh, Richard Pell uh, about uh, empty values. So when values are empty, uh, like a null for our type status, is that considered in the context of MITS to be missing? Um, a very, very good question. Um, what we're envisaging is that if the data are not in label, um, and uh, something along the uh, lines there's a paper being published, which I should be referring to, um, which has come up with standard ways of um, entering and recording missing data. Um, but we would want to be saying that um, the, the data are unknown and the reason for that being unknown. So whether it's unknown, not on the label or unknown illegible or unknown um, because the, the field has not been um, databased yet. Um, so I think that's that will be a key part of the of the future. And if there is something in there to say that, then it will be um, accepted within the the MIDS framework. Now that's that's important because it means that MIDS level two, if specimens are reach MIDS level two, then there may be data in there which may not be sufficient for some research. And I think that's that's an important um, recognition. Okay. Um, um, oh, thank you, Quentin, for putting the link in the paper. In the another chat. question from, uh, from David Shorthouse. Um, this is about the scientific name, uh, emits level one versus identified by emits level two. Does that mean that scientific name uh, in MITS level one is not meant to represent a de determination? Um, yes, it's um, it, to some extent, I would say any name applied to a, to a specimen is essentially a determination. Um, and I think that's gonna be a big part of the discussion for the task group is to look at um, what is considered to be um, a determination as such in particularly in a lot of um, collection management systems and what goes into into GBIF. So it's a, yes, it's a very good question um, as to what is perceived to be a, a determination, um, whether that's an automatic kind of determination or a human human determination. So I think um, I would I would say that uh, David will need to join the task group 
<laughs> which I'm sure he is, um, to to bring that into the into that discussion. Okay. Um, then there's a question from Joe Miller. Um, are the comparisons in the, to the DVF data the original submission or the interpreted data? Yes, and I think this is a really important one because um, some of the elements that we've got in the in MIDS um, can be um, can be interpreted. So, for example, we have in the MIDS level two, we've got um, the, the 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 complete geography and, and geographic um, tree, as it were. But we've also got a latitude and longitude. Now, if the latitude and longitude is there, then potentially you can calculate all the other values in there. So in some ways, the latitude and longitude is the critical one. And I think that is also the same with um, some of the, um, the the fields that were used. Um, it's a good question, but which were used for the for the analysis that I was doing. And in general, I was using the interpreted. Um, but I was also kind of cross-referencing with the with the original. Okay, I, I saw also um, that you uh, identified the hundred million uh, records as being mid level one, um, but I think in, in total there are about two hundred million uh, specimen records in GBIF. So does that mean that the other hundred million are um, above mid level one? Do you do you remember that? Um, they would they would not be above it because mids level one would be including um, it would it's kind of like a um, I'm trying to think uh, incremental so the the hundred million that were in that were mids level one. Sorry, I'm just going back to my figures. It's 105 million uh, mids level one. Um, no, most of the others were would be less than mids level one. Right. So effectively, uh, mids level zero then. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. I, I was expecting that they would be mids level two then, but apparently not. Uh, Okay, I think it's time to move on to the uh, next presentation. Uh, Sheriff. Uh, yes. Get ready. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And today I will be talking about uh, Fair Digital Object and some of the design and infrastructure decisions uh, for the DISCO research infrastructure that we're thinking about. Uh, we are currently in the preparation phase, so there's uh, still a lot of work to do. And uh, it's not just DISCO, we're also working with several other uh, global uh, organizations to, to figure this out. Um, so uh, imagine you're working with any type of uh, specimen related data, taxonomic, geno genomic, geographical, or in any applications. Uh, it could be database, repository, machine learning tools, and on any platform like cloud, desktop, mobile, or any other new platforms that we come up with. And we already do this in a variety of different ways. But how can we leverage all the globally distributed data that's still out there uh, and the applications in a scalable form, fashion? And to support this, a long-term vision for infrastructure behind this data, specifically for the specimen and the collections that are part of our collections and the workflow related to that. So this is one of the vision that DISCO is working towards. And for the architecture, the cornerstone uh, element that we have is this idea of digital object. Uh, so for a moment, we need to think about here uh, this two idea of the system centric world and the information centric world. So what, what do I mean by this? So think about when you upload data in a server. So, you know, end of the day, they're all zeros and one sitting there. But if you try to move this thing from one server to another server, you know, it, there's a lot of things you have to do because there are network layers, application layers that's attached to all the zeros and ones. 
And of course, there are ways to do this better, how you move things. But this creates a lot of problem for data migration and of course, sustainability and long-term data preservation. So this idea of digital object gives us a framework where we can move information easily uh, and create uh, different ways of providing new capabilities and new service. So we hide the system implementation details. And of course, it's important. It's not that they're not important. Implementation is, is very important. But we provide this uniform interface where different operations and different user base can, can come in. So this idea of digital object is not a new concept. Uh, I'll talk about the history in a moment. But how do we take this to our domain uh, for uh, collections and specimens data. So similarly, we have all this data scattered around the world or in different collections, different institutions. So we create object for these categories. So it could be specimens, collections, annotations, publications. And this digital object will have an identifier and specific property. And this object-oriented approach for our data is gives us a vision, which I'm calling a endless number of levels of abstraction. And why is endless? Because in the future, we'll have new storage layers, new services, new applications coming in. And of course, we are looking into the users. We, they're going to be dealing with the data, but from a different perspective. So for example, specimen data for a taxonomist uh, is one thing, but a specimen data for a curator or a museum administrator is another thing. So same data sets, but through levels of abstraction, you achieve uh, different things. So we need to support that. Uh, so we envision different service uh, from this abstraction uh, layers, loans and visit, curation, annotation, dashboards, or however new things we can come up with. It gives us the flexibility to move things around and also change things without disrupting the whole uh, data ecosystem. So for example, we decide to do something totally different with the loans and uh, visit transaction. These digital objects can easily move you know, to a different system uh, and it still be interoperable and usable and provide the similar uh, levels of service to the, to the user community and the researchers without, without disruption. So we take this idea and also think about FAIR, but a little bit of historical context here. So this idea of digital object, as I said, is not new. Some of the people that are involved in this also have been involved designing some of the foundation elements of the internet, DNS, TCP IP. So Robert Kahn is considered the, one of the fathers of the internet, uh, wrote this paper in 1995 with Robert Wilensky. So basically his idea of digital object is a data structure where the principal component is the data, the digital material, the bits, plus a unique identifier. And at that moment he was focusing on handle, but we can talk about other digital identifiers as well. So from 1995, we come to 2016, almost 20 years later, people started talking about research data life cycle. So this came out mostly from the scientific and research domain, but now it's getting traction in other areas as well. So when you produce data, uh, you need to make sure that people can find it either through search engine or repository, and then they can access it through some sort of protocol. Uh, and then when you download the data from a repository to your machine or another instrument, you have to make sure that it works and then you can reuse it or reproduce it from within your context, uh, which might be different from the data publisher or data provider context. So all those things are basically fair principle that sort of gives a best practice guideline to how to handle uh, data and how to interoperate with other types of data. And then recently we started, people started looking into within the global community that, hey, you know, the digital objects have this built-in built capability uh, to implement fair data. So why not both? So we look at this idea of fair digital object, which is basically a stable actionable unit that bundles sufficient information to allow reliable interpretation and processing of the data. And here, what is important, and this is also the beauty of this architecture is this idea of stable, sufficient interpretation. It will vary based on the context, uh, different community, different workflow. And this architecture gives us the flexibility to, to do this for a specific thing. Uh, so a, a sufficient information for one uh, specimen might be different for others or another workflow. So we need to accommodate 
those uh, multiple scenarios as well. So uh, why fair digital objects? A little bit more context here. Uh, as you all know, we're dealing with heterogeneous data sources and we need this digital representation uh, for the physical specimen, unambiguous and persistent. And we're looking for a long-term vision here, not just one or two years, 10, 20 years, and even 100 years. And then I already talked about this levels of abstraction where we it lets us create these services and vision and views for different uh, uh, audience and users and actors and agents. And then we can collect and anchor this core information about the specimen or any other objects that within our domain. Uh, and this core could be very limited or very dynamic depending on the workflow. And this information needs to be persistently linked to the necessary context for interpretation and validation. And this is also important that when, for example, the, what I was talking about, when you move data from server to server, this context will oftentimes get lost and we see problems with migration and inter interoperability. So that context needs to be attached to the digital objects through metadata and persistent identifier. And of course, there are standard operations like read, write, delete, update, and also there might be domain specific operations that for specific application that needs to be supported. And these applications will evolve 10 years later, we'll have a different version, uh, but that wouldn't make, that shouldn't make it necessary to redesign our data infrastructure just, just because one application has changed. So we need to be ready for that as well. So uh, Alex already talked about this idea of digital specimens, which is basically a particular type of fair digital object. Um, and it is digital representations, but it's more than that because it, it, it's a con digital containers and processable digital twins. So what we do with the physical data in our collection, you know, we have curation policies and standards. We take care of those physical, physical objects. So similarly, we want to create a workflow and system where we take care of the digital uh, specimen as well. Uh, and all the different workflows uh, levels of digitization that we talked about in the mid uh, talk will be tied into the workflow with other services and other data classes and other scientific workflow from different domain. And the DIS architecture helps us to, to, uh, to look at that vision of this interoperability. A few other background information here, how we came about with some of these design decisions and specifically for the fair digital uh, data lifecycle. So we borrowed a lot from some of the global conversations, specifically from the Research Data Alliance community and other communities that are working on fair implementation. So some examples here I'm highlighting, of course, the idea of digital object, I provided the history, uh, but RDA picked up on that and still continuing to talk about these things in the working group. And that is a fundamental element of the architecture. So it applies to all phases of the data lab circle. And of course the object needs persistent identifiers and kernel information that's coming from the kernel working group. Uh, kernel is the minimum uh, data element that you need to attach to your digital objects that, that describes the object. And of course, uh, when you aggregate these digital objects, you, you provide new services, new values. So we need to figure out how to do that. And that also applies to different uh, data life cycles that coming also from the RDA uh, research data collection working group. And when you do things with the object, uh, we need to know who, what, when, and that's where the metadata att attribution and the prof entities come in. And that's the RDA Tadwick working group. Uh, and this is very important for the workflow within the digitalization uh, that we're talking about. So all these things are helping us uh, envision different services that will be part of the DISCO uh, uh, e-service portfolio. And then we need to figure out how do we assess uh, those uh, implementation and specifications. So we looked into the RDA Fair Data Maturity Model Working Group. We're also part of one of the work package uh, in the Envy Fair project, which is mostly the environmental science research infrastructure in Europe. And there's also a Go Fair initiative uh, that is specifically interested in uh, implementing fair principles as a service uh, in different domains. So this is helping us to understand how can we define domain specific metrics and criteria for us. Some of these are very gen generic, but uh, this maturity model gives us a flexibility to think about specific use cases for us. But at the same time, because we're talking with Envy Fair and Go Fair, we can also 
uh, envision that some of these metrics will help us to talk with other research infrastructures. For example, if DISCO data moves to GBIV or LifeWatch or other uh, research infrastructure is still be able to do the similar things that, that we envision that data should do. So last we have this building blocks that, that we are thinking about in our future planning. So we start with the physical object from that you get the specimen and the specimen details, and then you build on with aggregation of that with collections and some collection overview and descriptions and all this element helping us to think about the loans and business systems, curation system, data refinery, and other future e-services that will be coming along as we as we progress. So, and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. And uh, yeah, if you have questions, please let me know. Thanks, uh, Sharif. Um, there are um, quite a few things discussed at the moment in the chat. Um, but these have been mostly uh, around um, scientific names and um, the difference between uh, changing scientific names because of changing taxonomic opinion and uh, changing names because of new determinations. So these are, are not uh, related to your talk. Um, there is um, a comment about um, the cent Central central um, registry of identifiers needed for this to work, mm -hmm. uh, like yeah. like your wives and um, the potential issue with that with uh, with link rods and um, breaking uh, links to uh, to the data. Do you would you have to comment on that? So yeah yeah it, uh, at the moment the digital object model is tied with the DOI and the handle system. That is true. Uh, uh, yes, there is a resolver that's needed, but it, it's not exactly centralized. I mean, there is a local handle server and there is a global distributed handle server that works together. Now, one of the thing when it comes to centralized and decentralized model, one thing we have to remember and that there is a technical decentralization where you have a bunch of systems floating around and you, you try to figure out that there's no single point of failure. So we have that idea in our design. So we have to make sure that, you know, if one of our component dies, we don't want the whole, si the whole uh, system to be unavailable. But at the same time, there's also political and governance aspect of that decentralization. Sometimes there could be a decentralized system, but the governance is centralized. So you could have a central body maintaining the decentralized system. So it'll be a mix of that. And the way I think uh, maybe it won't be a truly distributed solution, but we will have the way the handle system have local handle servers and uh, mirror servers. So in that way, it will be distributed. And the reliability comes from the expertise of the community, how we can provide the service uh, and, and the trust of the community. Uh, and of course, there is a lot of attention that need to be paid on for the, the training and data curation. Of course, you know, the PID is basically, you know, a lookup table, you have a string and, and location. And if that's not maintained behind the scene, people are not taking care of the data. Uh, even the distributed solution, oftentimes cannot guarantee on the resolution level. I mean, it might guarantee on the integrity of the data, but you still have to make sure that there's a map between A to B in, in, in some table. So that's where I think this, this interaction of decentralized, distributed and reliable will, will come on. And we're still very early on this, this process. So we are, we are looking into a lot of different things. So we are, we are definitely open to suggestion to, to think about this idea of you know, content drift and other link rod things, yeah. But thanks for the comment. Yeah, and it's it's good to, to know that um, uh, DOIs um, um, also um, can, can resolve to metadata. So they do not only contain um, uh, an, a locator, a, uh, one or more URLs where you should be able to find your data, but also uh, metadata. And part of that metadata could be a hash of the uh, of the data so that you could also use that hash to, to find the data anywhere on the, on the internet. 
And um, these, these are mechanisms that we, uh, we are still discussing. Um, but we are, for instance, looking into uh, the inter interplanetary uh, file system, which, which could be uh, coupled with, with uh, a centralized um, DOI index um, as, as, as a, a mechanism to ensure that, um, that the data is, is always available um, if it's, uh, if it's if maintained by somebody. Okay, we have uh, half uh, an hour more for, for discussions. Um, I will share my screen. So um, we put up some topics for, uh, for open discussion, but um, of course, uh, any other topics that you would like uh, to discuss um, uh, resulting from these, uh, these presentations are also welcome. Um, comments in the chat are very fast. Um, there's one comment from Guido uh, Soter. Uh, will this use data site DOIs? Um, well, we are uh, currently um, uh, discussing um, this with, uh, with the DOI Foundation and the, with data site and, and, and others to see what, uh, what would be the best. Um, the issue with, with using data sites is that, uh, first of all, um, we have many more uh, specimens um, in our collections than there are currently um, identifiers minted uh, in, in data sites. So if we would mint an identifier for every specimen in our collections, um, we would uh, kind of overtake um, uh, their current uh, um, repository and that does not really fit in their business model. So. Uh, that is an issue. Um, also, um, uh, the metadata scheme that they are currently you are, are using um, does not really uh, fit fit our uh, our needs. Um, so, um, what uh, what solution um, we we are going to take there? Um, we are not sure yet. We need to discuss that uh, that further with the data side and the DOI Foundation and, and others. Um, uh, uh, Valter, Patricia has her hand raised. Okay. Pet. Uh, okay. Hey, um, I'm following for the moment the uh, EOS conference for the European Open Science Cloud that is happening in the mornings, uh, European time, parallel with some of the TEDWIC sessions. And I put a link, they have currently opened for public consultation, a document that is based on uh, the fair maturity work of uh, the Data Research Alliance, that is uh, the second draft uh that shows the metrics that are uh, suggested to evaluate uh, how is the progress on making your data fair uh, and normally the european countries will use it to to see where the institution and where themselves are in terms of uh, providing their data in a fair manner so there is the occasion now to to look at this recommendation because uh it will probably also be applied to the research infrastructure and data that our community is uh, using, especially if we are European based, but I think it can also be interested for outside Europe. Uh, it's a 35 page document and I think it's worthwhile. It's, there is a link to a Google doc where you can uh, make suggestions and recommendations. So I would suggest to, to look at it. Uh, and for the question on data site, um, the, the EOS groups have also analyzed a bit and uh, they are a bit concerned about the cost of uh, having sufficient DOI uh, if we go down uh, 
the level in granularity for our community uh, to the specimens level uh, because they estimated that it cost uh, 7,000 euro per year per batch of 2 million DOIs. And uh, they identified if they look uh, across all the disciplines that it will be difficult and that we need to find a solution that it costs less. And um, especially uh, if we look at all disciplines, who is going to pay for this? So they look into PIDs, but they want to negotiate with data sites at a global level for all domains to, to have a more de democratic price, uh, to have persistent identifiers for all the data that all the different communities want to share. Thanks, Pat. Um, can you put a link in the chat to the, your document? Uh, I think the, the, the comment you made about um, negotiations between uh, EOSC and, and the UI Foundation are interesting. Um, they may well be um, willing to, to change their current business model, I think, because currently that is based on um, sharing identifiers for data sets and, uh, and publications and things like that, and not for individual um, um, record-based uh, data like, like our, our specimens. Um, so if we are going to share from EOS point of view um, on, on a, a data object level uh, data, um, then we will need much more identifiers and uh, then their current business model um, may not uh, be, be suitable and may need to be adapted. Uh, but EOS will certainly be a very strong partner in these negotiations, so uh, that would be a very good, uh, good news, actually. Alex, do you want to comment on that? Or? No, only, only to say that we're aware of the issue, uh, because, of course, there is a scale issue for the... Um, uh, uh, the number of identifiers that, you know, that is foreseen for for this domain um, and and you know it's inevitable that the that the business models of the organizations that are currently providing um, uh, persistent identifier services you know like data site like crossref are going to have to adapt as the nature of the requirements placed upon them changes but I think they they recognize that and they're open to it yeah. Uh, one of the things that is interesting uh, about uh, DOI, um, apart from, from um, uh, that they have been used for, for quite some time already and um, have been proven to, to, to work and to be trustworthy, is that the, the, the governance mechanisms uh, is a good insurance for us for the future um, that um, the identifiers that we, we, we start using, that um, they will be very persistent. Um, if, if one of the registration agencies uh, in the DOI Foundation is no longer capable of, um, of, of, of running, then uh, the other um, registration agencies will take over their tasks. Um, so this kind of governance model is, is very robust. And we really need in our domain, we, we need to, to have identifiers that we can use for at least 100 years or, or long or, or more. So these are very long time skills. Any other comments on this? No you should move to the wider questions. Yeah, uh, let's do that then. Um, so uh, we had we had some topics for discussion, and uh, first of all, we would like to know uh, if you know how to participate in uh, in the these uh, the standardization work in OpenDS in 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 MITS. Um, is it is it known um, what to do if you want to participate? Of course, you can you can always. 
um, leave a comment comment behind your your name in the in the document that we have uh, for today that you are interested to uh, participate. No questions about that. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the things that we have been discussing is, uh, is um, how we could uh, obtain funding for, for um, having uh, workshops um, really globally um, to participate uh, people in, in this discussion so that we do not have this discussion only in Europe, but uh, also in, in all the other parts of the, of the world. Um, are there any ideas for the, uh, obtaining funding for this kind of workshops? Not at the moment. Um, Walter, this is Deb. Yes. So funding, could, could we do them like the way we did the consultation for the um, online catalog for advancing that? How much funding are you talking about and what would it be used for if it's virtual? Um, yeah, we have we have one uh, like the, the consultation that we had for um, the, the catalog of specimens, uh, the global catalog. We are planning a similar consultation uh, in also in uh, in census um, for open yes. Um, but I don't know if that's enough. Um, we, 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 we need funding essentially to to support technical work. Yeah. Um, we need we need to bring people together either either virtually or hopefully you know, physically in, in the in the in the medium term you know to to, to get a focused you know effort on on on, on some of the technical details of, of of these pieces of standard work standards work but also of the implementation that needs to go alongside them um, so that would be helpful thanks for clarifying so uh, things like uh, the, the barbecues you are organizing for the collection description standards, like uh, the, this kind of really working meetings. Mm. Needed. Um, then we, we had a question, how can we get participation from the developers of the, the collection management systems? There are hundreds of collection management systems in the world a few big ones, and uh, especially for, for these, these big ones like, uh, like Specify and others, um, we think that these developers of these systems have a very good domain knowledge um, for, for uh, defining um, the, uh, the, the, the specimen model part of, uh, of OpenDS. Um, so the question is, how could we get more participation of, uh, of, of these people? Are there any in the in the room today? Perhaps you can comment on that. Hi Mo, are you there? There's a comment from Matt Yoda saying that he's hacking an example right now. Okay. She'll share in the talk tomorrow. Okay. Yes, tomorrow is a session about um, uh, collection management systems, right? Well, sir, I yes. guess I could say something. So it will be interesting to follow that. Was that James who, who wanted to say something? Yeah, it wasn't working. <laughs> Go ahead, James. Yes, go ahead. Hey, thanks. Uh, all I wanted to say that, uh, you know, as an example, I guess, uh, in, in the work uh, on DINA, the uh, collection management system that uh, a few of us are architecting, uh, especially Canada and Berlin, 
um, that uh, you know we've we've from the beginning been using the agile approach where we have the collection management people embedded in the process. So not only do we just grab their use cases and run away and do stuff, uh, we grab their use cases and then embed them in the system to test and test and test iteratively until we get to those versions of places we feel solid and move to the next piece. So um, you know we we don't well we don't walk away from them and present them what we think they need. Uh, I guess it's the story. And the, the good news is, is that the digital specimen, the mids, all of those things have, have, um, have arrived at the right time. Uh, we're we're in, in major development at the moment. And those concepts and the thinking about those concepts are, you know, influencing what we do and how we model. Uh, and uh, so I think, I think it's a good time. Um, and I think those kinds of services are going to start to show up. Um, and the interoperability between those services are going to rely not only on the identifiers, but the, the standards, the, the ability to, to move that data around uh, and, and to share not just data, but applications uh, and interoperability. Uh, yes, and, and uh, as has been pointed out by Falco, uh, we'll talk about this uh, more tomorrow. So that's very interesting, James. Uh, you know, would, would, would one or more technical people from DINA like to get involved in the OpenDS work? I'm putting you on the spot now. You don't have to answer if you don't wish to right now. Well, I mean, I think we're definitely listening and uh, I, I, I don't think you'll avoid us getting involved. Let's say it that way. <laughs> Thank you. And I think just to kind of follow on from that as well, I think um, the CMS developers, we're going to need them to be on board for the mids as well, um, particularly with missing data, because that's, that's, a, that's a, a real difficult problem. And I think it needs CMS developers to be engaged with that too. So yeah, it'd be great to have, have them on board too for that for mids. Just note in the chat that Falco says Berlin is on board. We knew that. Yes. Thank you, Falco. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> Okay, this is a, an, a question related to uh, directly to CMS is, is how to deal with, with um, custom fields, non-standard uh, data fields in CMSs. Because the aim of, of um, the, the digital specimens is to, um, and that's a bit di different from, from the approach that, uh, that was taken in the past with, with our core, it's not to share only a core set of data, but to share all the data that's available uh, as long as it's relevant for science. Um, this in includes the idea that we would also like to, uh, to give access um, to, um, to external experts to, to data that is, uh, is sensible or uh, sensitive or cannot be openly, uh, openly shared for, for, for legal reasons or, or whatever reasons. Um, so we will um, have some uh, mechanisms, uh, need to have some mechanisms in place for that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we will have to deal with, with a lot of, of data then that is, uh, is not standardized. So how, how would you um, deal with that? I see for instance in Specify that, uh, that you can just create your, your own custom fields, however you want them. Father, Deb's got her hand up. Yes, Deb, go ahead. So I, I think I actually wanna I wanted to tackle that last question, but they tie together um, this notion of you're asking how does a specific collection management system deal with or allow you to customize to what you need. But the question was how to increase the cross disciplinary participation and I and I think for the CMS developers, we have to figure out a way in which they can be in regular contact with one another this this sort of long-term vision of if they're going to develop things on their own because they are for their needs and their constituents so but can they develop their things in such a way that they're usable by the rest of the players in the environment if they all want to play nice together right so whether it's a tool or a software product um, is there a way in which they can be in regular communication about their short and long-term plans so that they can align them where they need and what does that model look like Um, I, I, I can answer that a bit, maybe. 
and 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 to say that you know that that that's really the the function of a standards forum is to you know to provide that neutral space where um, you know people that are involved in in, in development can congregate congregate around the development of the standard. Indeed, the people involved in the de development should be con developing the standard. Uh, and the standard is inevitably a compromise between the, the needs and desires of all of the different um, you know, development groups um, over the long term. But th that's where I see the coordination mechanism. Uh, it may be interesting to to um, to mention that um, one of the things that that make us a standard like open yes. Um, um, uh, Difficult to, um, to to develop and and and, and um, to to get um, um, being used by the community is is um, that we uh, often in different parts of the world and in different collection management systems even uh, tend to use different terms for the for the same things. So we have we are using different vocabularies. Um, for, for the items that we, we have in our collections. And I uh, created a an, um, an, an test that you could do as a kind of a survey. I put a link in the chat. Um, because we, will, we would be interested to, to know from, from you uh, as a community uh, what you think uh, a specimen is and how you would define uh, the term um, and, and what terms uh, to use. Um, and that could could help us um, de develop uh, some some uh, terminology, some labels for 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 users that are uh, more easy to understand in, in our work. So if you feel uh, that you you are an expert in this field, please uh, do this test, and we are interesting to to see the results. The topics again. Yeah, we already mentioned that there are some um, related upcoming events. Um, we will also have um, the related session uh, about enabling digital specimen and extended specimen concepts in current tools and services, which is on Friday. And uh, there will be uh, a session in the RDA plenary 16 um, in mid November in the interest group on the biodiversity data integration. Are there any other questions or comments? Walter, I just wanted to say a little bit about what I wrote in the chat there just for a second. I mean, I think we have to, we have to remember, you know, language, countries, uh, where you are, what your purpose is, how specific you're being, all of those things. I mean, the reasons we have labels and, and we build UIs is because that gives us the flexibility to relate to the people and what it is they're doing, right? And, and they own that. They, they own what process, what workflow, how they want to do these things and what they want to call something, what they want to see. But underneath what's super important is that we understand what the one meaning of that is as a standard thing and object and what its definition is. So that no matter what somebody's saying above in the UI or what color the UI is or any of those things, that's about the, the people using it, but the standard and the terminology matter to us. And, and I think we just, we have to make sure that we, and I think the process and consensus there is what's important. That's, that's what standards do. That's what that process is for. Get everybody on a page. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. 
maybe to, to comment um, a little bit more on um, the de determinations. Um, I think for, for DISCO, um, it will be, and for, for, for the digital specimens uh, concept, um, it's very important to, um, to start um, treating these, these uh, scientific names as determinations and not just as a scientific name. And that is because we would like to use these digital specimens um, as an enabler to, to have a, um, an, an, a community um, outside the institution um, that, um, that can directly um, contribute and annotate uh, the data in the digital specimen. So that could be either a, a taxonomic expert um, that, that could um, make uh, the determinations based on um, the, the images that he sees, for instance, or, or it could be uh, a machine that makes these, uh, these determinations based on uh, machine learning algorithms, these kind of things. Um, so for that, um, it would be very um, much needed for the user to know who made that determination. Was it a machine? Was it an expert? What is the expertise of that expert? How, how trustworthy is that the determination? because it's always an opinion. And then you as a user can, can decide whether to go with, with one opinion or another opinion at the end. Okay, we are about at the end of the session. Um, we have two more minutes. Sorry, if there are any additional comments or questions, please do so now. No, okay. Well, um, before the session on Friday, there's some time to think about uh, things. So um, I hope that you can sleep over it a few nights and uh, come back with, with uh, additional questions if you have them uh, in, the, uh, in the session on, on Friday. Okay. Thanks everybody for your particip participation. Great. Thank you, Wouter. Thank you, Alex. And um, thank you, Sharif and Ben as well. And thank you. Yeah, thank you to all the participants.